Hi everyone and welcome back to Biology 206, um, Ecology. We're in week four and our topic this week is Ecology and Evolution. Um, I'm Dr. Jennifer Baltzer and here we go. Okay, so evolution. Um, this is all going to be a bit of a review from uh, your first year course, but um, the definition of evolution is a change in the heritable characteristics of a population over a successive generation. So this is a long process where um, genetic changes are accumulated in the population through time. Okay, so the process is genetic changes or changes in allele frequency. So we're going to get into some of these details. And the outcome is the accumulation of differences from an ancestral form, so descent with modifications. So there are changes in the allelic frequency due to um, accumulation of genetic changes as well as natural selection processes. And then the outcome of this is some change in um, a species in comparison to its ancestral form. So descent with modification. And this is a really critical component of you know, all of biology, but in ecology it really dictates um, you know, the outcome of most ecological interactions. Um, you know, the adaptations that evolution has driven lead to the kinds of ecological interactions that we see. And so this is a really central part of this topic. So just some definitions, and again, this is a review. So a gene is a distinct sequence of nucleotides forming a part of a chromosome. Okay, so here we have two chromosomes, each of which we have a, a gene that is coded on that part of the chromosome highlighted. In this case, we have two different alleles, big D and little d. So an allele is one of two or more forms of a gene that result in the production of different versions of the protein that the gene encodes. Okay, so here we have big D, which is, as you recall, the, the dominant form of this particular gene, and little d is the recessive allele associated with this particular, or the recessive form of this particular gene. Okay, so then a genotype is the genetic makeup of the individual. And because we have recombination that happens during, um, during reproduction, we can end up with all sorts of different combinations of this particular um, set of alleles. And so you can have two big Ds, a big D and a little d, or a little d and a big D. And these all, um, so this one's homozygous uh, dominant. These two are heterozygous. But because we have a dominant allele, then we know what the phenotype will be. And then we have our um, homozygous recessive, which is our two little d's together. So these are our different genotypes with this particular um, set of alleles. And then the phenotype is the observable characteristic of an organism. So in this case, we're talking about sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis. And um, because the recessive allele is what uh, the, the um, is the G, is the, uh, is the allele associated with um, the protein production that leads to these conditions, um, you have to have this uh, homozygous recessive uh, genotype in order to result in the affected phenotype. Okay, so all of these, both the dominant homozygous and the heterozygous uh, individuals all are unaffected, so do not carry the phenotype associated with this per these particular diseases. Um, and this can this can hold for all kinds of things that are less um, uh, that are that don't don't um, that aren't associated with illness, um, but rather are associated with any kinds of characteristics that kind of describe what we look like, how we function. Um, you know our. Uh, any, any aspects of our life history, okay? So, these are just some definitions to review. This should all be review from last year, but I just wanted to go through those things again. And evolution is a change. Okay, so evolution is a change in allele frequencies. Um, so, 
definition here is a change over time in the frequencies or proportions of different alleles in the population. So if we think about our previous example with our Ds, you can just apply that here. Instead, we've got As, so our homozygous recessive, our homozygous dominant, and our heterozygous, our heterozygous genotype. Okay, and so we can see that as the frequency of A, uh, our recessive allele in the population decreases, the frequency of our dominant allele in the population increases, um, and we'll have the maximum frequency of heterozygotes in the population when our uh, frequency of our uh, of our uh, heterozygote, our heterozygous recessive and our heterozygous dominant are equal. And this follows um, this follows the rules of the Hardy Weinberg principle. And under this principle. We can um, we we know that uh, allele and genotype frequencies in a population will remain constant from generation to generation in the absence of natural selection influences. So, um, uh, or in the absence of other evolutionary influences, I should say. And so these include um, mutation, genetic drift, um, uh, natural selection. Other and, and other evolutionary forces that may come into play. And so once we start having those, those different evolutionary forces in play, it can lead to a shift in the frequencies of these alleles. But under the Hardy-Weinberg principle, in the absence of those, if we know the proportion of each allele in the population, that's gonna stay relatively constant. Okay, but this evolutionary process, so a change in allele frequencies, drives a really important component of evolution, which is descent with modification. And so we have populations that experience different environmental conditions, and these accumulate differences over time due to natural selection. And so you have the same species occurring in different environments, um, or the environment changes through time for a given population, certain traits will be will be more advantageous under those conditions than other traits and so those traits will be selected for and we know that the traits that are exhibited that are are acted on by natural selection are the phenotype which is based on the genotype which again is based on the allele uh, the alleles that that particular organism has so um through through time or across space depending on the um, evolutionary processes at play when a new species arises it differs from its ancestors and so this is the modification piece the the new species is different from the ancestral species in some in some way that that makes those species no longer compatible and although there are differences in the new species there are also similarities so this is the descent part so descent with modification and we can see this exhibited here. Right. So in this case we have sticklebacks, um, a really uh, diverse group of, of fishes. And in this case, um, this, this particular fossil is 10 million years old, give or take 250 years. So they're able to use some pretty amazing dating techniques um, to determine the age of these fossils. And you can see that this particular, uh, this particular, this ancestral species of stickleback has this complete pelvic foot bone. And then we know from the fossil record that over the next 16,000 years, um, oh, so we know from the fossil record that uh, this, this species of stickleback expanded its distribution, expanded its range into open waters from sort of more, uh, more near shore waters to more open waters. And this led to changes over the next 16,000 years in this fish. So lots of the bones, if you look at the bones and kind of compare what this fish looks like compared to this or this or this, most of the bones look very similar, but one place where we see a change is in the reduction of this pelvic bone to being absent in the, the newest, um, the, the newest uh, species of fossil stick or the, the newest fossil record of stickleback. Okay, so that's just an example where we have a lot of similarities. So the structure of the organism stays very cons consistent, but there's ch a change in, in the structure in terms of this pelvic bone, which 
could have implications for the ability. So if you imagine the situation where this, this fish tried to then reproduce, so we know different species are, species are defined in, in various ways, but one of the common ways to define species is the biological species concept. So species that are reproductively isolated. Okay, and so you can imagine a situation where um, these, these two species that have different structures in terms of the, the pelvic bone might, may no longer be compatible, okay? And so lots of similarities. We know that they're all sticklebacks, but this is different from this one in the context of that particular bone structure. And we can see this changing through time. So um, this is the time since the open lake waters were colonized. And so originally the pelvic score was very high um, for these fish. And then through time, it really rapidly disappeared, suggesting that there was a real disadvantage in its new environment to having that particular bone structure in its body. Um, we don't know exactly why, because these are fossil records, but um, that's a great example of descent with modification. Okay, so Natural selection occurs at the population level, not at the individual level, okay? So individuals, we all have specific traits. Now certainly there's plasticity. We've learned about plasticity versus adaptation. There's plasticity in the kinds of traits you can exhibit. So, you know, if you're thinking about a, a plant, you plant the plant in the shade, it'll have a certain set of traits. You plant that same, same, you move that same individual into a highlight environment, or you think about a canopy clearing opening above it. Its, its traits may change, and so it can respond to its environment, um, but it does not adapt to its environment. It is limited to the variability and traits that it can exhibit based on its genotype, okay? So there's a limited amount of variability in that phenotype because it has a particular genotype. But when we think at the population level, um, we have individuals occurring across landscapes and, and you know, maybe the conditions vary. And so in this example, we have these, um, oh, what are they called? Rock pocket mice, um, these cute little guys that um, one population exhibits this dark, um, this dark soil that has a, a it, that is lava based soil. So very black. And then the other one, the, the other population occupies this sort of sandier, uh, lighter brown substrate. Okay, now through time, there have been selective pressures acting on those populations of mice. And so within each of those populations, you might have had some individuals with light colored fur and some individuals with darker colored fur. Um, and on this dark substrate, those individuals with darker colored fur had an advantage over the lighter colored fur individuals because um, they would be less frequently spotted by predators. All right, so then all of those lighter color individuals were removed from this habitat, shifting the allele frequency toward those individuals that had the genotype that led to this phenotype, okay? Same thing goes for over here. You have dark and light individuals in this habitat. The predators are gonna be able to see those darker individuals better than the lighter individuals. So the darker individuals will be picked out of the, that population leading to directional shift toward this lighter phenotype, okay? And the genotype that supports that. So that's how, that's how evolution natural selection acts. It's at the population level, not the individual level. So, Within a population, individuals with favored traits leave more offspring. This is exactly what happened in both of these locations for both of these populations. And across generations, an increasing proportion of the population will have the traits selected for by natural selection. So in this case, dark fur, in this case, lighter fur, okay? So sources of alle allelic variation. We have two main sources, mutation, which is the, the primary source of genetic variation, right? So mutation occurs by a variety of processes. So a change, it's, a mutation is a change in the DNA of a gene. And so this can result from copying errors, from mechanical damage, while, um, while replication is occurring. 
uh, or from mutagens. So we think about, you know, UV radiation, for example. Um, there are all kinds of different uh, chemicals or um, energy sources that can lead to genetic changes or um, they're referred to as mutagens. And these are the sources of um, mutation and many, many mutations um, do not result in some adaptive benefit, right? They, mutations, uh, most mutations would be neutral. So have no impact. There are, depending on where that, it really depends on where that mutation is. If that mutation occurs in a really important coding gene, then that mutation can either be beneficial or, or negative. Um, but lots of times those mutations will occur in non-coding non parts of the genome. And so then the, the change is really neutral. So, um, and, and this can also depend on the environmental conditions the organism finds itself in. So sometimes there will be, you know, a mutation that occurs in a coding gene, but it doesn't have any, have any impact one way or the other in terms of the way that organism can function in its environment. Okay, so mutations can occur. Um, so both asexual and sexually reproducing organisms can um, can accumulate mut mutations in their genome. So this is this is something that can happen in, in both of those sexual forms. Okay, then recombination is the production of offspring that have combinations of alleles that differ from those in either parent. And we saw that in our example of the heterozygous and the homozygous individual and um, individuals with sickle cell anemia, or in our in our subsequent example that wasn't associated with any particular um, disorder or or trait. Okay, so this is where you know you receive half of your half of your genes, half of your chromosomes from one parent, half from the other, and this this component of recombination leads to. Um, leads to the genotype that, that you have as an individual and then ultimately the traits that you exhibit. Uh, and so this is gene shuffling this through sexual reproduction. This only occurs in sexually reproduc reproducing organisms. Of course, there are other clever ways of sharing and changing genomes uh, that re um, involve, uh, as opposed to vertical gene transfer, that, 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 that um, employ horizontal gene transfer. So taking genes from one organis organism and putting them in another. That's something I'm not going to get into, but that's certainly something that asexual organisms, bacteria and the like, use a lot and has contributed substantially to their evolutionary processes. So not mentioned here, but a really important contributor to allelic variation. Okay, so gene shuffling through sexual reproduction. And for, for many taxa, this provides a lot of the heritable differences between generations. You know, you don't have a lot of mutations that happen. Mutations accumulate fairly slowly, but recombination happens at every, um, at every generation. Okay. Okay, so natural selection increases the frequencies of advantage, advantageous alleles and decreases the frequency of deleterious alleles. This is exactly what we just saw in that rock pocket mouse example where, you know, having the alleles associated with dark fur was deleterious on the light substrate and vice versa, okay? So there's three different types of natural selection that we can see happening. So stabilizing selection, directional selection, or diversifying selection, which is also in your text referred to as disruptive selection. Okay, and this is what the shapes of these look like. So if you start with a population that is this blue curve, in all cases, this is the original, the blue curve uh, refers to the original population. And um, the y-axis is the frequency of that particular allele. Um, and the x-axis would be, or that particular phenotype and the x-axis is some arbitrary axis, axis corresponding to, to a, a phenotype. Okay, so in our example here, we have the example of robin eggs. So robins typically lay four eggs. This happens pretty consistently. If you take an egg out, the robin will lay another egg. If you add an egg in, um, when the robin hasn't laid four eggs, it will stop laying eggs, okay? So this is a, like very, a very consistent pattern in robin eggs. So it's a very, very narrow distribution of the, the trait in question, okay? So four. It's a, a pretty tight mean and standard de deviation around four eggs per nest. Now, why does this happen? Well, in the case of larger cl cl clutches, it may be the case that the parents can't feed the, the chicks sufficiently and you end up with malnourishment. Okay, so having too many eggs may not be good because you have too many mouths to feed. 
While smaller clutches may result in no viable offspring, if you've ever monitored a robin nest, there's a very high mortality rate. And so through time and through this stabilizing selection force, um, robins have sort of gotten to a point where four is kind of the magic number, okay? Now, directional selection is something we often think about where there's a change. So here we have our original trait and our original trait was this kind of, um, these are peppered moths and they're light, the, the original version of them was light colored, okay? But what happens is through time, there's selection for the trait to change in one direction or the other, okay? And we saw that in our rock pocket mouse example, in each of those populations, there was directional selection toward lighter or darker fur depending on the substrate, okay? In this case, we're talking about a situation where during the Industrial Revolution in the UK, um, it became a disadvantage to the, pepper, um, the, the peppered moths to be light colored because there was so much um, uh, dust and particulate in the air during the early, um, during the Industrial Revolution that there was just soot everywhere. And so many surfaces were darker colored than they had been before. And this led for selection, um, towards selection for these darker colored moths that camouflage better against these sooty surfaces. Um, so it re reduced predation when they had darker, um, uh, darker coloration, much like our, our rock pocket mice. Okay. Um, and then finally, diversifying selection. So um, here we have our original population, maybe it's a, a white rabbit. Um, and then, so we have two different uh, populations of, uh, or two different color variants of this um, rabbit. So we have gray rabbits and uh, Himalayan rabbits, which are gray and white. They, both of these phenotypes blend in better with the environment than the pure white phenotype. And so there can be selection for two different phenotypes and then selection against this original population. Okay, so when we talk about dis diversifying or disruptive selection, that's what we mean. We end up with two unique phenotypes that are both um, that are both advantageous, but there but anything in between, you know, uh, is is disadvantageous for that particular setting. Okay, um, another important consideration when we're thinking about evolutionary processes is genetic drift. And this is a change in allelic frequency due to a chance event. And so we talked about these allele frequencies when we were talking about Hardy-Weinberg. So here we have um, allele frequencies. And so we have um, some particular allele in the population. Um, and it's, you know, our alleles are, our alleles are at, let's say we have a, our, our big D and little d or our, um, uh, uh, our big A and little a, and in a large population, so here we have a population of about 2,000 individuals, those, gene, those allelic frequencies stay pretty constant, so somewhere around 0.5, okay? So, um, and that doesn't, that doesn't change a lot. When you start to reduce the population size to 200 or 20, all of a sudden the variation in those allele frequencies starts to vary a lot. So in our population of 200, you can see that varies from um, 0.2 to 0.8 compared to right in here between 0.4 and 0.6 for 2,000 individuals. Okay, and, and depending on random events, so you can see here this turquoise line drops way down, or up here through time this blue line drops way down almost to um, fixation of a single allele. Okay, so random events can really drive can really modify allele frequencies in smaller populations. And so when we move to our smallest population, so a population of only 20, we see this wild variation, everything from fixation of one allele to fixation of the other allele to this huge amount of noise. And so you can imagine a situation where um, you have a small population and you have, you know, you have two, two phenotypes associated with their respective genotypes and something happens and wipes out most or all of one of those phenotypes. That can happen when you have a small, small population. 
it's not going to happen when your population is this size, right? You're not going to have some ca catastrophe in this case, this person stepping on these insects. You're not going to have this kind of catastrophe if you have a very large population. It's not going to impact the population in the same way. If you have a small number of individuals, all of a sudden, just random chance taking out in the, the sort of random aspects of taking individuals out of a population through mortality um, can lead to big changes in allelic frequencies um, and can cause real problems for those populations. So um, when we think of those Hardy-Weinberg probabilities, they're based on infinite or very large populations like we see here. In small populations, the ratios often can't hold. So, you know, if we think about three offspring, that one to two to one ratio that we see in the Hardy-Weinberg um, equations is just simply not, not possible. Um, okay, so genetic drift is something that really impacts small populations, not large populations. Um, and the bottom line of all, is this, all of this is that we have a, a higher likelihood of loss of genetic diversity from small populations. Um, and this leads to a loss of evolutionary potential. So when you think about small populations, and we'll get into this from the perspective of you know, habitat fragmentation and that sort of thing, but humans have done a very good job reducing the populations of many, many species. Um, and this can lead to a situation where, where there's simply not enough, um, not enough individuals to maintain that genetic diversity within the population. Um, and this can lead to uh, big challenges in terms of um, the future ability to adapt to new environmental conditions. Okay, so here we have an example from your text. So, so this this aspect of of environmental or of genetic drift is a big problem for small populations, and we're going to take uh, this this example of the beautiful prairie chicken. Okay, so we have four different regions where there are prairie chicken populations: Illinois, Kansas, Nebraska, and Minnesota, and um, in Illinois, the prairie chicken population had dropped to fewer than 50 birds by 1993, okay? And so we can see in 1933, the prairie chicken population in Illinois was 25,000. And through various pressures on the prairie chicken, it dropped to less than 50 individuals by 1993. This is in comparison to very large populations in Kansas, Nebraska, and um, somewhat smaller but still fairly large population in Minnesota. Okay, so the authors of this paper looked at alleles at six different genes. In 1933, for Illinois, there were 31 alleles at these six genes. And this is very comparable to Kansas, Nebraska, and Minnesota, 35, 35, 32. So that seems pretty consistent when you have a good sized population. Once the population had dropped down to less than 50, there were only 22 alleles at those six genes. And so we see that, that, that impact of um, genetic drift on these populations, the loss of alleles, the loss of genetic diversity when the population gets small. Okay. Um, right, and, and of course the, the cause of this decline in population was habitat loss. So here is our prairie habitat in 1820, our prairie habitat in 1993. So massive reduction, almost, um, almost exclusion of that habitat from the state of Illinois that led to this dramatic de decline in the prairie chicken. Okay, so yeah, just as a summary of that, loss of alleles from small populations means loss of evolutionary potential. This impacts the ability of these populations to actually respond in the future to environmental changes, environmental challenges that they may face. So you imagine large populations in this intact landscape versus small populations in these little fragments like we saw with the prairie chicken and the kinds of, um, you know, a small, a small amount of habitat, of course, we know that the larger the habitat, the larger the population size. So the smaller the habitat, the smaller the population it can support. And those small populations are very vulnerable to genetic drift and losses of genetic diversity as a consequence. So this is a really important consideration when we're thinking about habitat fragmentation, when we're thinking about habitat loss. It's not just that that land has been transformed, it's that the habitat is reduced, which impacts population sizes, which impacts genetic diversity in those populations, 
which makes those populations more vulnerable to future environmental changes because they will simply not have the ability or they may not have the ability to appropriately respond. Okay, so next up we have this component of gene flow. So this is a transfer of alleles to, from one population to another via the movement of individuals or gametes. So in some ways, this, you know, this can act to introduce new alleles into a population. So functionally, it's a little bit similar, similar at the population level to mutation, right? Because that allele was not there before, and now all of a sudden it's there, okay? And it's, and it's, and it's beneficial. Um, so some of the outcomes are, of, of gene flow are the, the homogenization, the genetic homogenization among populations. So if you have adjacent populations and you have a lot of gene flow, um, if you have a lot of individuals moving between populations and reproducing with one another, then you're going to have very similar, genetically similar populations. Okay? Um, and this is what happens when, when populations interact. If you have very isolated populations, they will be genetically distinct. And we'll talk about how gene flow can impact that in a moment. But um, we can see how, you know, how this, how this can respond. So in this case, um, this is again another example from your text. We have an allele that, um, a mutation that resulted in an allele that, that conferred um, insecticide resistance in mosquito populations. Okay, so great those mosquito populations did really well and individuals of those populations were able to move out and um, transfer those genes to other populations okay and this often happens if you have a population that is doing very well individuals can um, um, can disperse from that main population uh, and 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 move out and um, occupy other areas Okay, so here we have frequency of, of the R allele in mosquito populations exposed to insecticide. And so we have a, a, low, a low rate here, the arrival of the mosquito with the R allele, so moving over into this population and then moving over into this yellow population. And all of a sudden that we go from having it absent in the, in the population to becoming a very frequent um, allele in the population because it conferred such a strong advantage to survival. If you're able to resist the insecticides that are being sprayed at you, you can do much better than your um, uh, your uh, your fellow mosquito who does not have that advantage. And so that that particular allele was was so advantageous that it became a very common allele in the population. Okay, but there's this idea that. Um, or the fact that gene, gene flow can also have detrimental impacts where populations have been isola isolated. And this is referred to as outbreeding depression. Okay? And so you can imagine a situation where you have, um, okay, so here we have a, a graph showing genetic similarity of mating individuals and the reproductive success. And so if your similarity of mating individuals is kind of moderate, then, they, then you have fairly high reproductive success. If the genetic similarity of your mating individuals is too similar, then we end up with what we all know about, which is inbreeding depression. We've heard about this. This is a much more common term than outbreeding depression. So this is, of course, where you have a fairly limited gene pool. And so the chance that you're going to have recessive alleles, recessive deleterious alleles um, manifested as, um, a, a, or have recessive, have individuals that are homozygous for recessive deleterious alleles, um, which will then mean that they they manifest that phenotype. It's much higher when you have in when you have this inbreeding depression happening. In contrast, um, outbreeding depression is where you have populations that have been isolated for a long time and have actually adapted to have diverged from one another and have adapted to environmental differences that they experience. Um, so in the case, for example, of our rock pocket mice, our black population and our white population or our creamy colored population, if those two populations interbred, offspring of those two populations would, would not do well compared to either of those populations on their own, okay? Um, so that's an example of outbreeding depression where um, gene flow from outside of that environment into the environment can actually lead to a reduction in reproductive success. Okay, um, 
Right, so if parents are too different, then hybrid offspring with intermediate characteristics will not be favored. And we'll see examples of this in our, um, when we're talking about different mechanisms of speciation. Okay, so then we have this, you know, this term adaptive evolution is a process of changes driven by natural selection in which traits that confer survival or reproductive advantages tend to increase in frequency over time. Okay, so, you know, we have all kinds of amazing examples of this from nature, from this, um, this, this gliding mammal in the canopies of tropical forests that has produced these flaps of skin that help it glide across through the canopy, um, to this, uh, oh gosh, what is that called? Um, a thorny devil, and these ridges help it to really, um, draw water to itself and, and absorb that water in this really arid environment. And then we have this fish that is actually able to like squirt water up into, into foliage above it and knock that spider down and then eat the spider. So um, these amazing adaptations to different environments that, um, that, that species have, have evolved through time that, that make them well adapted to the environment. So there are certainly lots of traits that are not necessarily adaptive, but when we think about adaptive evolution, it's these traits that really confer an advantage in that particular environment, and as a consequence, are increasing in frequency through time. And likewise, when we think about climate change, this, can, this has been shown to, to um, uh, drive to underlie some signatures and adaptive evolutionary processes. So here we have a little Drosophila. What we're looking at here is the frequency of ADH. Um, uh, it's an allele of the alcohol dehydrogenase gene that codes for a form of the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme that is more effective in warmer temperatures. So ADHS is the the allele of that alcohol dehydrogenase gene that, that produces an enzyme that, that does better under warmer temperatures. And so we tend to have this latitudinal gradient in the frequency of that allele, the ADHS allele in the population. And so at low latitudes, so close to the equator, that ADHS allele is very common. At high latitudes, so away from the equator, it's much less common in the population because the temperatures are not as warm. So there's not an advantage to having that, um, that allele. So we see this latitudinal gradient, but we can also look at this between time periods. So this has been monitored, this client has been monitored through time. And so from 1979 to 1982, here we have the relationship between latitude and the frequency of the alcohol dehydrogenase S allele, okay? And in 2002 to 2004, the planet has already seen substantial warming in that time period. That curve shifted upward. So the frequency of the alcohol dehydrogenase S allele is more frequent at any given latitude than it was in the 1979 to 1982 census, okay? So there we can see that although the general relationship holds, we can see that climate change signature in the frequencies of those alleles. Okay, so evolution will not always lead to a perfect organism environment match. And there's a number of reasons for that. And the first of this is the lack of genetic variation. So maybe that beneficial allele is not present. So in the case of our mosquito population, until the arrival of that, in, until that um, mutation occurred in this red population, and until the arrival of that allele in this blue and this orange population, that wasn't a possibility. Right, and so if that if those if that genetic information if that if that material to, to drive um, adaptive evolution is not present, then it simply then it simply doesn't happen. Once that arrived, of course, it got fixed into the population. But until that mutation occurred, that was not insecticide resistance was not a possibility for this population. So, the beneficial allele may not be present that would lead to that adaptive advantage. Okay, so the second way that you can end up with sort of an imperfect organism environment match is because of evolutionary history. So natural selection, of course, can only act on the traits on the traits that are present. So ancestry plays a really big role. So here we have an example of marine mammals. Of course, 
um, marine mammals are, they live in the ocean, um, and it would be really advantageous if they were able to use gills to extract oxygen from the water. But instead, what they have to do is surface um, to breathe through their blowhole, which is connected to something that looks pretty familiar to us, right? So a trachea and lungs. And so they, their ancestry did not have that set of traits in terms of gills that can extract, provide the surface to extract oxygen from the water. And so instead they have this different evolutionary adaptation that comes at the cost of having to resurface and breathe at the surface of the water, breathe atmospheric oxygen. Okay. Um, and there's the other piece of ecological trade-offs. So this situation where one function reduces the ability to perform in others. So no organism or species will be perfect. So the idea that adaptations represent compromises. And we already talked about this when we were looking a couple of lectures ago, talking about adaptation to shade and the fact that you don't have any organisms that have you know, really high photosynthetic rates, but that are also able to be very shade tolerant. Um, that there are certain combination of traits that are simply not possible. And it's these trade-offs, these ecological compromises that are, are really important to consider. And so this is a population level example where we have individuals that um, reproduced. So that's the blue line is individuals, reproductive individuals. And the red line is non-reproductive individuals. And what we see is that the non-reproductive individuals have a much lower mortality rate. So here we have age on the x-axis, mortality rate, so um, the, the frequency of death on the, on the y-axis. And we see that those individuals that reproduce are more likely to um, die or, and, and die at a younger age than those individuals that don't reproduce. So there's these trade-offs between, in this case, between reproduction um, and long lifespan. And we very frequently see these kinds of trade-offs when we're thinking about adaptations. You'll have, that, that's why we don't have a single perfect organism that's able to, you know, grow fast and live a long life and reproduce like crazy. You know, these, there's, there's sets of traits that, that there, there are certain parts of kind of the trait space, if you will, that it's not possible to occupy just because, um, the costs of one trait, um, the costs of one trait mean that that other trait is not is not possible in combination with the first trait. Okay, so adaptations represent compromises. Okay, so moving on in our discussion, we're going to talk about speciation, and this is something. This is a, again a concept that's going to be really familiar to you. Um, here we have on the y-axis genetic difference and we have on the x-axis time and so you have some original parental species and through time two populations of that species become more and more different until at one point so here maybe interbreeding is still possible but here we have two distinct species that are no longer reproductively compatible let's say so this is a, a the process of speciation so that divergence, that genetic divergence through time until you no longer have um, work, until you get to a point where you have two distinct species. Um, but what I want to dive into a little bit more deeply is these different types of speciation that can happen. So allopatric speciation, parapatric speciation, and sympatric speciation. So Allopatric speciation is the formation of a new species that occurs when populations are geographically isolated. And so this is really the typical type of speciation we think about. You can imagine populations on either side of a mountain. They can't make it up and over the mountain. You know, they've been separated because of some vicariance event um, that, that separates the populations physically and through time they diverge. So this is a very typical type of speciation that we, that we often think about. So, Divergence of populations into separate species as a result of geographic isolation from one another. And so the, the roots of these, of allopatric is allo is other or different, and patria is country or fatherland. So you can remember what, what this term means from that, from that name. So 
different countries or different regions, right? And so this is what this looks like. So um, we're talking about allopatric speciation here. So we have a single species at first. Um, and some geographic separation of the species. Maybe, maybe it's a river, maybe it's a mountain, you know, maybe you can, you can think of any, any of your favorite, um, tectonic events that happen that lead to separation of lands in a particular landscape. Maybe it's, it's something like, um, you know, habitat fragmentation in the landscape where you have, you no longer have movement of populations between one and another. Um, so we have geographic separation and through a lot of time, so, so over, over a long period of time, those populations uh, become genetically distinct. Now this can be due to natural selection processes. Maybe the environments in those two regions are different um, and it leads to selection for different traits in those two regions, like we saw in our um, rock, uh, rock pocket mouse populations. Uh, or maybe it's genetic drift. Maybe, maybe that separation led to really small population sizes um, and genetic drift so you no longer have genetic similarity between populations. But there are different mechanisms that can lead to this, but we end up with two species in the end after a, a long period of time. So um, geographic separation, spatial division of populations, um, you potentially have different habitats that those organisms are living in, leading to natural selection processes acting on um, different, different traits to lead to um, genetic, genetic differences, and or, again, those small populations that may drift apart via genetic drift. Okay, so just to give a more tangible example, um, here we have allopatric speciation in, in Satina. Um, and so we have this original species up here, and this is, um, this is the uh, San Joaquin Valley in um, California. And so you have some original and ancestral population up here. And then this, this um, salamander dispersed on either side of the valley. And so that valley represented that geographic separation between um, populations of this species. And those populations dispersed down along the valley, uh, along either side of the valley. And through time, um, some differences started to become pretty apparent on the coastal side of the valley, in the coast mountains and the, and the coastal populations. Um, we ended up with salamanders that looked a lot like this. And in fact, they were uh, cohabiting the, that area with, uh, with a newt that, that was poisonous and had um, bright coloration. And so mimicry, so um, the, sub, the subspecies of um, Encetina that came down this side of the valley, um, they, they evolved to mimic that poisonous newt and that protected them from predation. And so having that bright coloration that looked a lot like that poisonous newt led them to have higher um, survival than if that bright coloration was not present. And so um, mimicry drove um, differences that, that selected for newts that looked a lot like this, or sorry, salamanders that looked a lot like this. On this side of the valley, the coloration of the salamanders was really dictated by camouflage. So we ended up with sort of these spotty salamanders that camouflage better against the, um, the leaf litter and the substrate that they were living on. Um, there was no advantage to having that bright coloration because there was not the actual poisonous um, newt living on that side that would, that would help to support their protection if they evolved that strategy. So we have populations that have been, diver that have, that, that, um, have been separated for a long period of time across this valley. And when they come back together, when these populations eventually reached the bottom of the valley um, and came back together, there's very little, although they overlap and the subspecies, these are still considered subspecies, but they meet and they do hybridize. Hybridization rates are really low, so about 8%, and the hybrids have greatly reduced viability. And so it's not advantageous for the bright color newts to um, 
mate with the camouflage newts and vice versa. It, both, those are two very, very different life history strategies. And um, so in the extreme south of this population, um, basically these species behave or these subspecies behave as true species, true isolated species. Okay, so here is a great example of allopatric speciation. So parapatric speciation is a mode of speciation in which differentiation occurs when two populations have contiguous but narrowly overlapping ranges, often representing two distinct habitat types. So habitats side by side really close together, there's the potential for gene flow but something is stopping that from happening. So para means beside or near, patria, again, country or fatherland. And so our parapatric speciation is where you have some um, currently unoccupied habitat in the landscape. And so that becomes the habitat that a new population um, occupies and diverges from the previous population. Okay, so here's the, the new population in this light green here within the old population, so an adjacent um, adjacent area. So range expansion into a new adjacent habitat, and, and you end up with subpopulations developing that become increasingly reproductively isolated. And it's a situation where hybrids have reduced fitness, and so you have to have hybrids with reduced fitness, otherwise that gene flow would continue, um, and you wouldn't have two separate populations. Okay, so a great example of this is um, an example of um, grasses where you have um, in, in uh, mine tailing sites where you have some uncontaminated soil directly adjacent to contaminated soil. And so um, there's lots of great evidence that shows that um, uh, you end up with a different set of traits in the grasses that are able to grow on the mine waste. They may be able to sequester the toxins that are in those soils. They may change their root to shoot ratios in order to respond to those conditions. They may take on different mycorrhizal partners uh, to help accommodate that. Um, in this case, the plants, um, so there's the, been the development of heavy metal tolerance by plants in the mine waste. So they're able to actually um, take up and, and sequester uh, toxins from the soils and that's not that that trait is not present in the uncontaminated soils and typically that kind of tolerance of some contaminant or some toxin comes at a cost and so being able to tolerate heavy metals in this population the growing on uncontaminated soil would be detrimental but also not being able to tolerate heavy metals would be detrimental to the population on the mine site so you can see where that hybrid um, between those two populations would have reduced fitness okay and in fact, there's other mechanisms of separation that happen in these. So this, this is a great example from, um, we see similar evidence from uh, sites in Sudbury, for example, around the nickel mining um, uh, tailings in that area. So plants exhibit different flowering times, and this helps to prevent cross fertilization. So it reduces the likelihood you're actually gonna have a hybrid. And so gene flow is reduced. So gene flow is reduced not only because the hybrids will be less successful, but because the plants have evolved to separate their, their reproductive times. Um, and so in this case, directional selection is likely to be the important driving force. So we move from the uncontaminated soil sites, we've seen this already, our directional sel selection graph, where we have some um, mean set of traits over here in our uncontaminated soil, and living on the contaminated soil forces those traits over to a different um, position in that kind of trait space, okay? Finally, sympatric speciation. So speciation that occurs within the area of distribution of the ancestral species. So the distribution of these species is overlapping. So the differentiation of two reproductively isolated species from one initial population within the same local area. So speciation occurs under conditions um, under which there's a lot of potential gene flow that could or does happen. And so sim means with or together. And again, patria means fatherland or country. So our name tells, tells the story there. So when we look at this one, uh, it's over here where we have um, overlapping species with over, completely overlapping distributions where there's ample opportunity for gene flow. So what is happening in that situation? And that's where we have this directional or disruptive selection where for some reason, individuals of the, within those populations um, 
certain sets of traits on either end of this spectrum are selected for, but having kind of the middle set of traits, the average traits, is not beneficial um, in any part of that environment. Okay? Um, so, sympatric speciation, there's no geographic or spatial isolation, and disruptive selection is most likely the mechanism. So, um, and that's coupled with assortative mating. So, um, species, uh, individuals within the population that have similar traits mating with one another. And so that keeps, that helps to reinforce this separation during this disruptive selection process. And so a great example here is um, um, Arctic char. And so here's the species name. And so we have, um, they co-occur in, um, in lakes and one, one form eats zooplankton in the upper pelagic zone and one form eats invertebrates and small fish near the bottom of the lake. So even though they're the same species living in the same lakes, there are individuals who feed at different positions in that lake, so pelagic and benthic feeders. And you can see that there are differences in the structure of the mouths, in, in some of the morphology of the, fish, of the fish. So specialized mouth morphologies um, allow them to perform those feeding functions. And if you had intermediate individuals that had a mouth somewhere in between these, that wasn't, that, that mouth wouldn't be very good at pelagic feeding or at benthic feeding. And so those intermediate hybrids are not, are not advantageous in any of the, any of the settings that this species occurs in. Okay. So each form has a distinctive behavior that also leads to kind of separation of those species um, or of those, of those individuals within the population to different parts of the, um, of the lake and can then further lead to reproductive isolation. So behavioral differences can drive these, this reproductive isolation in this particular population. Okay, so three different types of speciation that all lead to different outcomes in the context of, you know, what that would look like in the landscape. Okay, and so we just talked about speciation, but the diversity of life reflects both speciation and extinction rates. So of course, in any given, you know, um, for any given number of living species, there's a whole lot of other extinct species that tell us a lot about what got us to that end point of the living species. And so here we have, um, you know, a very simple tree of, of pinnipeds, um, mustelids here, and then seals and walruses up here. And the red points indicate the most recent common uh, ancestor. And we have, we have living species indicated here and then extinct species. And so, you know, as an example, we can see, um, this, uh, this species here, uh, Pugila darwini, uh, which is extinct, but looks an awful lot like a mustelid, looks an awful lot like a weasel. It was actually a, 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 an ancestral form of seals that was able to walk on land, but also um, swim in the water. And so it spent time in both of those environments. And you can, you know, you can imagine when we have these kinds of um, fossil records that show us what early ancestors of, of extant species look like, it gives us a really good um, idea of how the evolution of these species occurred and the kinds of traits that were selected for and selected against um, in the transition to what we see in the current diversity of species that we have on the planet. And so, yeah, the fossil record gives us all kinds of information about, you know, forms that species that are familiar to us take on. So this, for example, is a, a fossil horsetail, or um, for those of you who are familiar with the scientific names, Equisetum. And we have lots of these in forest environments, and they have, uh, they proliferated in, in past environments, particularly when we think about something like the Carboniferous era. Um, there were some really giant horse tails. And so we can look back through the history of species by examining the fossil record. It can also give us clues to stepping stones, evolutionary stepping stones. And so um, this particular fossil is one of those stepping stones. So a tetrapod, it's a tetrapod. And so there are these four-legged terrestrial vertebrates um, whose, whose living members include amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. Um, but 
this was one of this was a stepping stone from the lobe fin fishes to the tetrapods. So we have all of this information locked into the fossil record that tells us about extinct species that led to the, the current endpoints we have. Um, and also provides us information about species that are that are no longer um, no longer extant that don't have a, a current day analog. So we lost, we'll talk in a moment about mass extinctions, but many, many taxa and many genera, many families, in fact, have been lost during mass extinctions in the past. And so some organisms that we see in the fossil record have no analog today on the planet. Okay, so mass extinctions. Um, this is from your text and it shows the, the five big mass extinctions. This one is from National Geographic, and I, and I think it's important to identify the fact that we are in the midst of a Holocene extinction, and that is um, being exacerbated by the um, many, many human activities, climate, um, climate warming, habitat fragmentation and loss, the kinds of things that we, we talked about as threads that weave through this course. They're really important anthropogenic transformations of the planet that are driving the sixth mass extinction on this um, on the planet. And so there have been, prior to that, there were five other mass extinctions. And here we have extinction rate in families per million years. So families per million years. And this is through um, geologic time. So it goes through these different um, uh, eras. And so um, this, this nice figure from National Geographic kind of walks you through these different um, ex mass extinctions, um, some of what led to the mass extinction. So typically this has been a major environmental change. So sometimes it, it's attributed to big uh, periods of really active, uh, you know, um, active volcanic periods where a lot of um, ash and material is, is projected into the atmosphere, which can act to really rapidly cool the planet, for example. Um, meteorites were the, are the main, um, uh, mechanism that uh, drove the extinction of the dinosaurs, for example, here at the Cretaceous Pelagene, uh, Paleogene extinction. Um, and so that impact of that meteor drove all kinds of massive changes to the planet, including sort of um, creating toxic water and air in some places that drove to really, that drove really ma uh, rapid um, mortality events. So. Take a read through this, but we can see that through time, and so this is showing us something different. This is showing us the extinctions per family. This is showing us the number of genera through time. And so we see that we are at a period in time where we have more genera than we've ever had in the history of the planet, but that there have been these setbacks. So here we have this big drop. Here we have another big drop and then another big drop. So this is showing us something slightly different than this one, but I think it, it, it gives us a good indication of the types of taxa that were lost during those um, mass extinctions and the mechanisms driving the mass extinctions. And so always a big stressor to the planet that drives loss of um, biodiversity. Okay. So um, when we're thinking about evolutionary processes, we have to remember that there are these feedbacks between ecology and evolution. So um, you have, you know, all of these dynamics happening, and we're going to be talking about a lot of these, uh, all of these levels through the course of, of, of this term. Um, you have dynamics happening within populations, communities, ecosystems, they interact with one another. And those dynamics so you can think about something like predation or parasitism or any of these kinds of biotic interactions that occur um, or abiotic pressures on communities or on populations that drive evolutionary change. So pressures that selection for certain traits will, will lead to an advantage for a particular species in that, in that environment. So we have these dynamics that can drive evolutionary change, but also evolutionary change that can drive dynamics. So we sometimes hear about, you know, um, arms races between different taxa where an evolutionary change in one will lead to a rapid change in the other, for example. And so there's these, there's this interplay between ecology and evolution that's really important to consider. And so we have this little simplistic example here where we have um, this population of lizards, and this is before the introduction of some large lizards, so a change 
in the community, right? And so in this case, the small lizard perches on ground, rocks, low vegetation, um, and, and consumes arthropods in that part, in that position. So it spends a lot of time on the ground and in the low, um, on, on low parts of the tree. Now, this large lizard comes along and all of a sudden, and, and consumes, it's a predator for these small lizards. So all of a sudden there's this new pressure within the community that's driving um, strong, um, is a strong evolutionary driving force driven by an ecological change that leads to, um, leads to a situation where populations of these lizards that spend more time up in the canopy or higher positions in the tree, they do better. And so they're selected for. So this ecological process drives the selection force that, that alters where these lizards are occurring in the tree. So the small lizard then, um, it's, it, it then um, within those lizards that um, spend more time in the upper part of the canopy, evolutionary processes drive um, the adaptation of those lizards to that canopy position. So evolving shorter limbs for higher vegetation, um, uh, and, and, and increasing the population size of that small lizard population there, um, simply because of these, these, the, this adaptation that ultimately was a response to an ecological interaction. Okay, so it's just important to recognize those feedbacks. It's very complicated and really a, a really exciting point of interface. Okay, so the last couple of slides have to do with evidence for human induced evolution. And there's lots of evidence for this out there. Um, there, there was a recent, um, some recent work that showed really definitively the role of, of um, ivory poaching on driving selection for tuskless elephants. So that, that was kind of, you know, uh, the most recent example to my mind of those, of those human induced um, evolutionary, um, that, of human induced evolution. But a couple of examples from your text um, include this example of, of foxes. And so there are different fur, different, different phenotypes um, in, for fur, and they, they, they're associated with, uh, of course, with different genotypes, different allele combinations. So the red fur fox that we see, you, I often see them run around my neighborhood. Um, this, this has a, a, the dominant um, fur color. Uh, it's a, uh, sorry, homozygous dominant for fur color. There's also foxes that look like, uh, that are, have a reddish, red, have reddish black fur. And so you often see kind of these black furred um, foxes. They are heterozygous. And then there's silver furred foxes that look like this, that are kind of like the reddish black fur foxes, but have these, have this silvery tip. Um, now, when the fur trade was really booming, um, these silver foxes, these silver fur foxes were, were prized. Um, people really liked the coats on these. And so they were hunted, um, preferentially. Okay. So trapping these silver fur foxes was really, um, the preferred, the preferred fox to catch. Uh, and this drove the decline of the silver fur genotype and phenotype. Um, as well as the decline of the black fur phenotype and really led to an increase in the, the dominant, the homozygous dominant um, fur color, which is the, the red fur coat that we see most commonly. So this is one great example of how human um, activities can cause directional change in populations. Fitness, there's a fitness advantage to having red fur because it wasn't favored. Whereas this, this fur was really favored for, um, in, in the fur, in the fur trade. So, um, one example of human induced evolution. Okay. A second example has to do with these big horned sheep. And so, um, we very frequently hear about the term trophy hunting. Um, and typically what, um, trophy hunters want to take animals that are the large animals that have the largest, uh, rack. And so, um, the largest set of horns or antlers. And so in the bighorn sheep, 
those individuals that had very large horns were hunted preferentially compared to individuals that had smaller horns. And there's a relationship between body size and, and horn length. So larger individuals tend to have larger horns. And through time, we have seen, so here's 1975 and, and present, well, almost present day, we've seen a consistent decline in the average weight and the average horn length in bighorn sheep. Um, that was really driven by um, these trophy hunting efforts where it was advantageous to, for sheep to have smaller horns and um, smaller body sizes compared to those lar the, the larger horned individuals who were, were hunted out and their, their large horn genes were lost from the population um, or re were reduced in the population. And so this selective pressure on a portion of the population that is often imposed by these hunting efforts. So whether it's silver haired foxes, whether it's large um, horns on sheep, whether it's the presence or absence of tusks and elephants, whether it's the size of cod, the cod fishery is another great example where we now have a, have a species that, that is the size of it has shifted downward dramatically due to really heavy overfishing. Um, and selection for large individuals. And so because we as humans, when we are hunting, when we are fishing, et cetera, we're selecting for a certain portion of the population, this drives directional selection for those individuals that don't have, the, have those traits that we are after as humans. Okay, so that's all I have to say today. Um, we'll continue our conversation about ecology and evolution next uh, next lesson, um, but have have a great day and we'll we'll talk soon. Thank you.